to Freedom Fellowship. You can follow us online at cometofreedom.com. My dad loves preaching verse by verse studies of the Word of God giving its full counsel. Enjoy today's sermon and make sure to subscribe right now so you don't miss any future teachings. Uh, Tonight we're going to be considering uh, the hymn, The Old Rugged Cross, together, and I'm excited to do that with you guys. Um, In a little bit of background, I want to share with you guys, my daughter popped up on my phone. That's always cool. All right, thanks, guys. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Philippians 3. We'll be there in a little bit. But I want to share with you guys, back in 1990 or 1913, uh, George Bernard, um, he was struggling with some problems that really caused him uh, suffering in his life personally. And his mind during that time kept going back to Christ and the suffering that he went through upon the cross. And this really, guys, gets to the heart of the gospel. Because without the cross, there's no good news. There's a reason why Jesus laid down his life, that we may live. And if there wasn't a sacrifice, there's no good Friday. So, we look here, and I want to consider um, the cross with you guys tonight, because oftentimes we look at the cross as an icon, don't we? How many of you guys have a golden cross? Okay, when I was a kid, I wore a a necklace all the time. I had a gold cross. Gold was cool back in the 80s. Um, Maybe that, any of you kids wearing gold chains nowadays? No. My son has a black one with a cross, which I think is cool. Anyways, uh, we consider the cross, right? Um, It was a rough, splintery thing, okay, stained with gore. Um, And as we study and as... um, Here, uh, George studied, and he was going through Philippians 3, verse 10 specifically, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, He had gotten the theme for the hymn that we just sung together, the old rugged cross, uh, which has really become a favorite to many people. Bernard was an evangelist in the Methodist uh, church movement, um, and he was praying during that season in his life for full understanding. This is actually what he said. He was praying for full understanding of the cross in its plan in Christianity. So over a period of time, he studied more and more about the cross and all that meant for us, what theology uh, comes around that. And he prayed, he meditated upon the cross until one day he said, hey, I saw uh, the Christ of the cross as if it were seen, John 3.16, leave the printed page, take form, and act out the meaning of redemption. So the theme was so great, guys, it needed a song. And that's kind of where the old rugged cross was birthed out of. In Elbion, Michigan, uh, Bernard sat down to write the tune. He only could come up with the words, I'll cherish the old rugged cross. That's all he could get. That's all that was coming out and trying to write this song about how the cross and the study of it and all he was learning, that's all he could get out So he struggled for weeks, okay, trying to get the melody and um, to get it written. But Bernard, he was scheduled to preach a series um, of messages in New York City. And he found himself focusing on the cross and became increasingly more urgent. And he sat down again there in Elbion, Michigan, uh, to write the words. And he said this, I sat down and immediately was able to rewrite the stanzas of the song without so much as one word failing to fall into place. I called my wife, took out my guitar, sang the complete song to her. She was thrilled. So June 7th, 1913, George Bernard introduced the new hymn in a revival that was taking place and being conducted in Pokagon, Michigan. And the old rugged cross soon became a top 10 hymn in the 20th century. I think that's kind of cool. So, a little history. I've done that a few times. This isn't normal. We don't normally teach hymns <laughs> here at church. But I have shared a few over the years and a little bit of the history and the background to it. 
But I wanted to consider with you guys Philippians 3, verse 10, and the verses around, the same ones that kind of really pricked George's heart in such a way in really bringing the importance of the cross in what that all means for us as believers in Jesus. So let's take a look together. We'll pick it up in verse 7 tonight. But the things which are gained to me, now who wrote the book of Philippians? Anybody? Paul, right? The Apostle Paul. He says, these have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the <clears throat> dead. So on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross. This cross, the cross of Jesus, really is the central point of all of history. Think about it. We have B.C. and A.D. after death, after Jesus died upon the cross. I mean, that's how we tell time and history, right? It's him upon the cross. So that single event for which all time was created, even from the foundations of the world, guys, God knew that the cross would be the focal point. And I think we miss that sometimes. We want to make it about this or that. And God had a plan. Before the foundations of the world, he was slain. Where? Upon that cross for you and I. And that cross and what he did upon it is not just for us. It is for all people. You guys understand that? He so loved the world. So even as he created man in his own image, okay, perfect. They were perfect there in the garden without blame, without spot. He knew that one day that they would fall, that they would sin. He knew it. And yet, he did what he did. And in doing so, we know we need a Savior because we blew it. And we can't save ourselves. If you guys think you can save yourselves, that's another gospel. That's not what God says, okay? So in the days preceding man's creation, God created time. Time had never before existed. And the Son of God always shines in heaven. Think about that for a second. There is no need for a sun and a moon in heaven. There is no day or night in heaven because Jesus himself is a continual light. I think that's going to be pretty cool, okay? In our Reality, one day when we finally get there in eternity, our minds are going to be blown because we live right now and we're constrained by time. That is something God has instituted. It's a reality we live in here now. So all for the sole purpose, okay, of time. Why then did God establish time? Because there was a sole purpose. There was a day, as we considered last Sunday, right? God told us the day, prophesied it hundreds, hundreds of years before, that he would come. The Messiah would come. Why did he come, guys? He came to be that sacrifice. He came to save us. So he came in order to die for you and I. All life on earth revolves around the whole rugged cross. And as Paul in our passage here really contemplates all of this and what the cross represents and how we relate to Christ. And did you guys catch it here? We relate to him in his sufferings also, right? The theory that we can really earn our way into heaven, okay? When we consider the old rugged cross, that's all out the window. Take a look with me. It says, but what things were gained to me. Now, this was the Apostle Paul, and you guys know he's my hero, okay? I think he's just the bomb. <laughs> and yet, he understood that his own righteousness, all the good things that he had done or thought he did, religiously speaking, he says, hey, I counted all lost for Christ, all of it, okay? 
So in other words, he says, all the things that might count as a prophet, I now reckon as lost for Christ's sake. So what things? Well, we know from other letters that he wrote, he had a lot of credentials, didn't he? He was circumcised when he was a week old. He was born uh, an Israelite, um, tribe of Benjamin. He was pure blood Hebrew all the way through and through. Um, and as far as keeping the law, hey, he was he was actually considered a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, we're told. Um, and he says, I was je- or zealous, and I even to the point of persecuting Christians, the church. That's a big, you know, that's, <laughs> he, he was out there. He was obeying the law, the righteousness of the law. He really thought that he was in a place of having no fault. But all those things that I might count as profit, I now reckon as loss, is what he's saying. You guys get the point that Paul is making here for you and I. This is something we need to grasp, and we can't grasp this truth without understanding the cross. So, Paul, he says, anyone who thinks that trust in some external ceremonies, I have an even more reason to feel that way. And if anyone can earn their way into heaven, he says, hey, I can, but he says, it's not so because it doesn't work that way. I, it's all meaningless. All the things we think we can do to earn our way to heaven, it means absolutely nothing. All that counts is the righteousness given to us because of the sacrifice Jesus made. Okay, His life that was perfect. right? An old rugged cross, the emblem of what? Suffering and shame is what the hymn tells us. Think about that, guys. Crucifixion was a form of execution that the Romans had learned from the Persians. And the Persians had developed the method of crucifying their victims by impaling them upon poles. But later cultures developed different methods of crucifixion. Okay? In Rome, guys, they employed several of them. And by the time of Christ, crucifixion had become a norm. Okay? A favorite method in which people would be executed by the Roman Empire. Do you guys know that during the time of Christ, there in Jerusalem, there had already been about 30,000 people crucified. So think about that. If you lived there, hmm, this is a normal form of punishment, of judgment, of execution. So people are very familiar with what was going on. The crosses with dead or dying men hanging on them was a very common sight, okay, and the constant reminder of that Roman brutality, okay, it was an emblem of suffering and shame. I love that old cross. Why? Why? That is where the dearest and the best for the world of lost sinners was slain. That's why. So Paul was trying to get to heaven he was speaking to his credentials, his credits, his success, su- successes, trying to make that point. But after showing that he could beat these Judaizers at their own game, being proud of who they were and all that they had accomplished and all that they had done, Paul showed them that they, they were wrong. They're playing a completely wrong game to begin with. That's not what it's about. Okay, and we need to be very careful in considering the past achievements that we have because we can get to a place like Paul was where, hey, look at me, look what I'm doing, and that gives no place to relationship with God then, no relationship with Jesus. That's what the law does. That's what Paul is getting to here. I mean, he said... It is all loss when compared with the greatness of knowing Christ. So this tells us this person's, a person's relationship with Jesus is more important than anything else. It's more important than how long you've been going to church. It is more important than how long you've been an elder. It's more important than how long you've been serving in kids' church. <laughs> it's more important than anything that you have done, Okay. It's more important than how many Bible verses you've memorized or how many times you've read through the Bible. The point is, guys, it's more important than anything in the world. That's the point. Are you guys tracking with me? Okay, because this is it. This is gospel truth. So you are, <clears throat> you may say a certain event in your life is the greatest accomplishment, okay? 
And for some people, well, maybe it was going to college, you know. That changed my life. Greatest decision I've ever made. Maybe it's, hey, I got married and I had kids, my family, that's it. But to know Christ is the greatest decision you'll ever make. You guys understand that? It's the greatest decision. Some people don't believe that because they don't believe we can't make, can't make that decision for ourselves. But it's the greatest decision I've ever made. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever. Okay? And just because you're in a church tonight doesn't make you right with Christ. It doesn't mean you have a relationship with him. Okay? What you need to do is believe the gospel. But I've been a good person. <laughs> Look what I've done. I've been in church my whole life. That doesn't save anybody. Just because you go to church doesn't make you right with God. Jesus is who makes you right with him. Amen? So the cross, guys, despised by the world, even though the cross was a common sight in Jerusalem, it wasn't always a welcome one. To see men hanging there in this intense pain, screaming in agony, terrifying, that would be a very haunting sight to behold personally. From Thomas's remarks after the crucifixion, we learn that Christ was nailed to the cross rather than being um, you know, tied by leather straps, which sometimes they would do when somebody was crucified. Uh, he was actually nailed. So Christ was nailed to the cross, stained with blood so divine, we sang that, okay? And as it lay there flat on the ground, this is how they would fasten. They'd have the cross on the ground, okay? nailed the person to the cross, these long tapered spikes. I forgot it. I had a railroad spike. It's kind of like that, but a little bit sharper. Um, driven into the wrists and the feet. So after being nailed to place, guys, the soldiers would slowly elevate the cross up and carefully slide it down into a hole there um, and causing the full weight then of the victim to immediately be borne on the nails that were in their wrists and hands and this would cause a major joints in the body to suddenly twist out of their normal position. And that probably is what Christ referred to. You guys, recently we've taken a look at Psalm 22. And that is a prophetic psalm that was written 1,500 years before Jesus. It was written 400 and some years before crucifixion was even invented by the Persians. But if you read that, God knew exactly what he was doing. It's a messianic psalm. Okay, and you read through it, and you're like, well, that's talking about a cross. That's about Jesus dying on the cross. There in the Old Testament, very clear. Um, but verse 14, it says, I am poured out like water, and all my bo bones are out of joint. That's exactly what happens to somebody when they're crucified. So the emblem of suffering, okay, despise sight for the world to see, to experience this spectacle of pain and suffering, but ha has a wondrous attraction for me, for the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. Check out verse 8 with me here, guys. It says, <clears throat> I throw all these things away, all good things away, because he gave all his glory away for me, and I consider all the things that I've done as mere garbage that I may gain Christ. That is what Paul is saying. And then in verse 9, guys, we see that there is no amount of law-keeping or self-improvement, discipline, or religious effort that can make us right with God. Righteousness comes from God and God alone. So we're made righteous by trusting in Christ. That is the truth of the gospel. So Paul gave up everything, family, friends, um, freedom, in order to know Christ and his resurrection power. So we have to access, or we have access to this knowledge of this power. But we may have to make sacrifices to enjoy it fully. And I want you guys to follow me here, okay? So what are you willing to give up in order to know Christ more? A lot of you guys do know him. But you guys know that we actually grow in knowing him? Can anybody testify and say, hey, I know Jesus a whole lot more today than I did just even six months ago, okay? We can grow in our knowledge of him in that relationship with him. So a crowded schedule, okay, 
is an excuse a lot of us, well, I just don't have the time, okay? Well, what can you carve out and prioritize? I'm going to spend more time reading his word. I'm going to spend time with him. Maybe it's taking a walk with him and praying, talking, and getting to know him, making a point to be in fellowship with brothers and sisters that are going to stir you up. <laughs> Those are good things. Um, and sometimes we think, well, what are others going to think if I do that? Will my friends approve of me seeking the Lord in such a way, okay? And maybe some of your plans for pleasure. Well, I'm going to say no to that because I want to make time for him. He's going to be a priority. We have those choices. So the dear lamb of God, he left his glory above, right? What are we willing to leave? The old rugged cross, guys, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. I want to share with you something I found by a doctor, a medical doctor named Truman Davis, who studied the physical effects of the crucifixion, described uh, some of the agony that Jesus would have gone through when he died upon the cross. Um, As arms fatigue, he said, great waves of cramps, they sweep over muscles, nodding them deep, relentless, throbbing pain, with cramps coming in, inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, the pectoral muscles are paralyzed and the intercostal muscles are unable to act. Air can be drawn into lungs but cannot be exhaled. Jesus fights to raise himself in order to get even one short breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and the bloodstream and the cramps partially subside. Spasmatically, he is able to raise himself upward and exhale and bring life oxygen, hours of limitless, limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joining, running cramps, intermediate physical uh searing pain of tissue torn with his lacerated back as he moves up and down against the rough lumber. Then agony begins. Uh, another agony begins, a deep crushing pain in the chest as the Uh, pericardium uh, slowly fills with serum and begins to compress his heart and is now almost almost over. A loss of tissue fluid has reached critical level and a compressed heart is struggled to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissue. The tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to gasp gulps of air and markedly dehydrated tissue sends the flood of stimuli to the brain. And once strength and feeling in the legs are gone, the victim would be unable to push up in order to breathe, and death would occur quickly. So that's a little bit of a description of what Jesus went through. I know that's a little graphic, but I think for us as believers, guys, do we understand the lengths he was willing to go? I must go to Jerusalem. We looked at that on Sunday. I must go. Why? Why? to go through all of this for you and I so we could be forgiven of our sins. We like that part of it. We just don't like thinking about what had to actually happen in order for that to happen. So just think about the old rugged cross, what it really was. How many of you guys like splinters? Ever have to remove one? My children are screamers when it comes to splinters. They're pretty tough in general. But man, pulling out a splinter, it was the end of the world. Think about what Jesus had to endure upon that old rugged cross. Just think about our Savior's back. It had already been torn to pieces because he was flogged within an inch of his life. Okay, Just think what he felt against that (laughs) old rugged cross. For twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish that old rugged cross. I will cling to that old rugged cross. So what would it look like to cling? I ask myself that. I like this hymn. But George, what do you mean cling to the cross? Jesus clung to the cross for me already. Am I really called to do the same? What does that mean? As you hold tight and cling to that old 
rugged cross that's been ravished, splinters. Can you feel the love of the Savior? Can you feel the warmth of his blood that dripped down? Look at verse 10 with me here in Philippians 3. It says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. That sounds pretty cool. Okay? We're talking tonight about Jesus dying for the sins of the world. Okay? But we know that couldn't hold him down. It didn't keep him down because he overcame our sin, death, and hell. Because we know on Sunday what happens. He rose from the dead. Okay? So I encourage you guys, come out Sunday morning, 930. Okay? We're going to talk more actually off of this. These two studies are going together because we're going to take a deep look into the love of God on Sunday morning and the reality of the resurrection and what that means for you and I. But here, guys, Paul is saying this, okay? All I want to know is Christ and experience the power of his resurrection and, did you guys catch it, to share in the sufferings and to become like him in his death? Oh, wait a minute. I like that idea of resurrection power in my life. You know, I want to live in the reality of a resurrected life, but you want me to have fellowship with God, with Jesus, through suffering? What's up with that? Now, we don't have time to really do a deep dive into that, but how many guys can testify and say, yeah, I've had real fellowship with God through suffering. Some of the most intimate and closest fellowship I've actually ever had was through suffering, Right? So Paul emphasizes here, he's really, you know, he's gaining a deeper knowledge and intimacy of Christ. And he's sharing that with us. He's testifying to us. So this fellowship of suffering refers to a partnership, a deep communion of suffering that every believer shares with Christ. So who is able to comfort suffering Christians because he has already experienced the same suffering infinitely more, right? So, to that old cross, I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach. Gladly bear. The symbol of the cross has really lost meaning today, guys. Well, what's the cross? It's jewelry. Okay? I know some people that got cool cross tattoos. Right? I got, t- I got several t-shirts that have crosses on them. Would you guys agree with me? The way we look at a cross is a little bit different than how Paul understood, how Jesus understood where he was about to go and how he was about to suffer and to die. The cross was vile, guys. The cross was repulsive. If you're taking notes, I know we're not doing a whole lot of cross-referencing, but one tonight, Deuteronomy... 21 verse 23 his body shall not remain all night upon a tree but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day for he that is hanged is accursed to God in the land be not defiled which the Lord thy God has given thee as an inheritance wow accursed is the land who hangs upon the tree and that's exactly what Jesus did He took our sin, even though he was the sinless lamb of God, never once sinned, the perfect sacrifice. He became sin for us, guys. He took all of that upon himself for you and I because he loves us. And it is not something, guys, to be worshipped, okay? It's not something to put in high regard, but since Jesus hung there upon a cross... Okay, we might say those words. I love that old cross. It's a wondrous attraction for me. It is a wondrous beauty. And to that old cross, I will be true. I will cherish that old rugged cross and I will cling to the promise that it provides. And check out, we're almost done here. Paul in verse 11, how does he conclude this thought? He says, if by any means... I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so in the hope that I myself will be raised from death to life. Okay, I really don't like the crucifix. Okay, the picture, the symbol portraying Jesus upon a cross. Okay, why? 
Because Jesus ain't on that cross any longer, brother and sister. Okay? It's, it's the wrong message. <laughs> um, he is very much alive. Okay? Um, but the picture and the symbol portraying Jesus on the cross, because it's not where it ended. Jesus came down and he rose again. And that, guys, is how he'll call me someday to his home far away where his glory forever I'll share. One day I will exchange the old cross for a what? A crown, okay? A crown of eternal life, which the scriptures speak about. So I'm going to have the worship team come back up. I'm going to sing this song one more time. But as we conclude, guys, maybe tonight you've laid claim to that old rugged cross for the first time. Maybe you've accepted the price in which Christ paid, okay, that you could be forgiven for your sins. But maybe you're not living a life that truly honors <laughs> Jesus, okay, in a, <laughs> for who he is, all that he's done, okay? The cross that pardoned you, you need to cling to the sacrifice every day. I mean, it's cool that we get to do Good Friday, once a year, but as we walk with the Lord, the reality of Good Friday, isn't that a daily reality for us? No matter what we're going through, you know, every time I'm going through something or I have doubts, maybe even faith, or things aren't making sense, or God, why did you allow this? Why is that happening to them? When you look to the cross, doesn't it put things kind of back into perspective? You're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, you really do love me. You really do love this world that continues to forsake you and rebel. You love us despite us. What a Savior. What a God. And then Jesus tells us in the scriptures, take up your cross and follow me. Some of you guys don't like this message tonight. But that's what our Lord and Savior said. Yeah, I took up my cross that you may be saved. I bought you with a great price. Now you follow me. You follow my example. You pick up your cross. You follow me. So maybe tonight, guys, you're living like Paul, okay, striving, doing your best to get into heaven. But all those things are a loss. They are nothing but garbage, you guys are students of the Bible, go check out that word rubbish. It's dung. It's poop. That's what Paul says his righteousness is. It's nothing. The best of our righteousness is God declared through the prophets as filthy rags. That's why God did, had to do what he did. There is no other way. And did he have to do it? But he loves us. That's why he did it, guys. He loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter how bad you think you've blown it, God still loves you enough to give his life for you. If you were the only one here tonight, the gospel, the truth of what the scriptures declare, it would be for you. Only by that old rugged cross can you say, hey, <laughs> he'll call me someday. So do you cherish that cross? Do you cling to it every day? Will you exchange it someday for a crown? I pray that's true for each and every single one of you. Let's stand. And let's sing old rugged cross once more. Thank you.
guys can remain standing. I want to share with you guys. You guys can go grab a seat and grab your communion cups. All you guys can grab communion cups right now. Um, in Galatians 6, I just want to share uh, one scripture with you guys here. Okay, I'm going to share three scriptures with you from Galatians 6, just because it's so good. Uh, look here at verse 12 with me. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these compel you to be circumcised. In other words, keep the law, right? Only that you may not suffer persecution for what? The cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in what? Your flesh. But catch what verse 14 says, guys. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And that's something, guys, we do as we partake of the Lord's table because we're told by him, do this in remembrance of me. Remember my life and remember what? My death upon the cross, right? So we're going to conclude our time remembering together. I'm going to pray and we can partake. Father, thank you so much. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of the gospel. We thank you for what you did on that cross 2,000 years ago for us. What a Savior you are. 
God, and we do testify with the prophets of old that you and you alone are mighty to save. You alone are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for how you love us. We thank you that you were willing to give all of yourself to lay down your life that we may have life in you, eternal life. God, thank you for your sacrifice. We do remember and we say thank you, Jesus. Let's partake of the bread and the cup together. One last request, Father. I do pray for each and every man, woman, and child here tonight or who are taking this in online. God, would you, Holy Spirit, show us, Lord, things that we can cut out, things that you'd be asking us personally to sacrifice, things that we need to count loss that we may gain you to truly enjoy you to fellowship with you even in the hard things in this life. We thank you. So thankful that you're there through it all. Jesus, you are our priority. You are it. God, help us to grow in your grace. Lord, help us, Lord, to Share this good news with this world. We desperately need you. God, we thank you so much, God, for how you love us. God, and we know that in this life, we're going to have trials, we're going to have tribulations, but we know that this life goes quick too. There's a day really soon when we're all going to see you face to face. We so look forward to that. But until that day, Lord, would you help us to walk in the reality of Good Friday, all that you have done, and because you live, all that you are doing. Help us to walk with you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I sure hope to see you guys Sunday morning, 930. Again, kiddos are going to head straight downstairs at 930. And if you guys are coming, please sit close to somebody. We want to make a lot of room for Easter. All right, love you guys. Have a great night. We hope you were blessed by the teaching of God's Word. If so, would you please take a minute, like us, subscribe, and leave a review. This is a free way we can reach others with His Word. You can watch video teachings of sermons on our website, cometofreedom.com. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.